Hello there. This is Jay Frost speaking to you, of course, uh, from London, where I've been uh, having the, the opportunity to talk with a number of leaders uh, over the last couple of weeks. This is my second round doing this. I, I of course, visited here last summer, uh, courtesy of our friends at DonorSearch, who have been sponsoring this series back to 2016. Um, and in fact, 2016 is an important date for something else we'll be talking about in a few minutes. Um, we have over 500 of these programs. You're going to find a lot of that content uh, over on the DonorSearch site. Um, at under the resources tab, that's at donorsearch.net. Uh, otherwise, I won't be talking much about them today because our, this is an opportunity to learn from one of the leaders in philanthropy and fundraising around the world. Um, he has uh, given us the, the honor of uh, appearing in the series previously, talking kind of a narrow uh, remit, and today is a, a chance to be in the candy store of his work and talk a bit more broadly. So this is also a chance for you to engage in this conversation. Um, we're going to occasionally keep an eye on a laptop down in front of us. So if you have comments or questions, I hope that you will pose them here. Uh, feel free to use the chat. In fact, feel free to open the chat right now, if you would, and just say hello. We would really love that to let us know where you're coming in from and, and which organization you're with, which part of the world you're in. Um, and then additionally, we have the Q&A, which of course is the way to make sure that we don't miss your questions. And you should feel free to pose any question you want at any time if we miss it for some reason. And we're not likely to miss it there, but if we do, or if we can't get to it, we'll make sure that those uh, questions get uh, uh, provided to our guest today so that he can address them perhaps in the future. Um, there'll be a lot of opportunities for him to do that because he is talking with people all over the world in uh, this world of fundraising and philanthropy as we're about to hear right now. So with that, thank you so much, Ben Morton Wright for hanging out today. I really appreciate your your willingness Welcome to, to London. Out. Welcome to the UK. Thank you. Thank you. Very great. Um, this is the first time I think we've met in person, met in person. probably for a while. Probably yes, for, for a, a long, long, long time. time. <laughs> a long time. Um, and you've been everywhere in between that time and now. And uh, even during the pandemic, I think you were quite active both virtually and physically yep. uh, throughout the world. I mean, this literally the world of philanthropy. Mm -hmm. um, one of those, those things which we'll talk about, I know, is talking philanthropy which yeah. you've been doing since 2016. That's right. That's yeah, right. It was the first one in my house. It really? started in my house. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> okay. So the home studio is a thing here. <laughs> the first too. one is my home. It's kind of crazy in the middle of nowhere, but that's for another day. Right. Um, <laughs> well, there's a lot of that content and we'll get to that because you will want to see it. And we'll make sure that there are links to that included uh, uh, both live here and in the show notes. Um, but the, the earlier story, of course, is your work in general. So predating that global philanthropic. Okay, I'm not going to tell people what global philanthropic is. <laughs> would you would you mind telling us a little bit about the company when it was founded? You're the founder, of course, and the CEO. When did you found it, and maybe why? Yeah, no. It? Well, thank you for asking. Um, so uh, it's been a journey, um, and I was a professional fundraiser for ten years. And during the period that, uh, of that, I I began to appreciate that there was more around the world to be had in terms of philanthropy, and also that. Uh, maybe there wasn't a brand in philanthropy that could actually you could interact and and find out more about that world of philanthropy. And I also was very interested in Asia. So um, it was in the late 90s, I developed the idea of the business and then basically did a, a big research project on it and then launched it over 20 years ago, set it up in Hong Kong, which is a bit radical. So I turned up and uh, rented a cupboard in Hong Kong over 20 years ago. And weirdly enough, it's the same building that we're in, but it's not a cupboard anymore. It's a decent office. So there we go. <laughs> in the middle of uh, one chai at that time. And uh, so moving out to Asia, moving physically out to Asia, and then we set up in Australia and, and et cetera, and built it over, over a number of years. So yeah, it's been a journey and uh, an interesting one and the world's changed and philanthropy's changed. But I think the global philanthropic concept was really this idea that we could bring the world together under phil philanthropic umbrella. Which is quite a charge, except <laughs> for yourself. Yes, right. Um, so. How is that going? Um, I think it's going, well, it's interesting. It's been a journey. Um, I think in a way, you know, at that time when you talked about global philanthropy 20, 22 years ago, people didn't really understand that. There was kind of, what does that mean? Mm -hmm. You know, um, there was a lot, quite a few inspirational people that I had lucky enough to hang around with at that time who'd written a lot about globalization and what that meant. And at that time, it was just emerging. So you know, I think maybe it was slightly ahead of its time and then it became very of its time. And obviously now I believe in philanthropy, the global context is even more important, but of course the world has 
in a way become a little bit more introvert and barriers have gone up so you know that that move to a more open and, and giving culture around the world has been a process and a lot of that's still happening the pandemic i think was very positive about that but it's become more challenging in many ways because of the geopolitics and the politics of the world to recognize that by the way i think it's going to swing back you know i think it's going to get we're going to go back to that helping each other around the world concept Okay. In the next decade. So well, that's, my, that's my first we can, forecast. We can say that glass is <laughs> half full part, maybe for, for later. It'd be good to end on a, on a happy note with that prediction. Uh, but before we go there, maybe I, I'd like to ask you, is that a surprise, this kind of fractionalizing of, of, uh, of yeah. the environment for philanthropy, particularly? We're supposed to be working well, together in this world. Yeah, I mean, I, I have a very particular view about this actually and I think the pandemic was a huge problem you know obviously state the obvious but I think that what came out of the pandemic was that while the world really couldn't coordinate uh, in terms of government and people really really found it very stressful and very difficult to actually kind of get our global act together eventually we did to a degree but philanthropy actually led the charge and I think the lesson there is that philanthropy is an incredible platform because in a way it's non-political it's about humankind and womankind it's about mankind it's about everyone coming together and trying to help each other and in terms of the sort of vaccine platforms and the interventions for philanthropists the response from philanthropists I think you know uh, you know when the history is written of philanthropy I think that will be seen as an amazing moment when the philanthropic world came together and actually tried to sort a problem whilst the political world was quite fractured so I actually think that it's been a good moment for philanthropy actually responding to the, 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 the you know, the, the terrible stress and awful thing that we've been through. I mean, it's kind of like a broken arm. You've forgotten that you had it now after we're after it. But actually, it was terribly stressful when we were going right. through it, right? It was awful. And a lot of people lost their lives and it was terribly traumatic. And the response from the philanthropic community, I think, was... Um, was, um, was, you know, is something in the history of philanthropy that will be a significant moment. And that is different. I mean, when you talk about the 90s, for example, or even earlier, philanthropy, when I think about philanthropy in, in Asia or, mm -hmm. or in Europe, or the UK, um, uh, certainly the United States, there have been these big campaigns. I don't remember big campaigns very often anyway for NGOs who are mm -hmm. addressing big uh, systemic issues uh, like a pandemic obviously would be. Yeah. Um, there are those historical presence, you know, the early campaigns for, that were um, in response to major events. And we've had major events like Katrina is just one that comes to yeah. mind or yeah. Ache or things yeah. that, that inspired a lot of philanthropy, but not these massive kind of campaigns. And as you say, people really came together in a different sort of way exactly. during the pandemic. Um, so that seems like a highlight. Um, did it surprise you the kinds of people who came together? Well, I think it's, you know, um, I mean, yeah, I mean, and the way that people reacted, I mean, people, um, we explored this in Talking Philanthropy, um, which if people are interested, you could explore more because we did a whole session and the UN Foundation did a case study on terms of the corporate response there. And they were set up brilliantly to actually funnel all of that money around, but the, around the world, but the response there was very immediate and they responded very quickly to, to enable that uh, funding to be distributed and the case studies there. But, you know, others, even uh, foundation, family foundations in Asia and across the world, you know, they kind of, they, they move differently. They move quickly. Right. They kind of tore up the rule book and said, right, we can't just, you know, we can't wait for applications. We've got to get the money in, right? Right. So we kind of relearned that response to nature. And, they, and a lot of families stepped up. And I think it's never totally been recognized no. what philanthropy did during that period. And, you know, while governments really found it stressful, understandably, how to respond, they didn't know philanthropy actually in many ways and the way that the philanthropic community responded I think was quite remarkable so I think in time we might look back and say you know what that was a moment um, I'm unfortunately I think maybe that strength and, and willing to, willingness to partner you know maybe has weakened since and it'd be great to get back to that I think we have the same issue now with environment you know we have the same opportunity to all work together this is another huge problem the world has got and we're going to have to work together and philanthropy is going to have to work together so that's another a piece in our global 20 interviews we've done four interviews in different elements of the environment um, and Doug Gurr in particular who's is an incredible individual there's a wonderful interview that we've done who talks about how we can respond to the environmental challenges and 
the positive story about how we can intervene and make a change. And a lot of that can be driven through philanthropy, but it'll only be done if we do it in a coordinated way. And sustaining that kind of energy is hard, you know, even with institutional actors. And they may have a commitment that individuals, they don't have. I mean, they're trying to pay the rent or the mortgage or something, right. but institutions are specifically designed to address the things that they're in their mission statement. But that doesn't mean they're necessarily always designed to work collaboratively, especially across border. Right. Now, if they were doing that, what, if any, are the impediments to continuing to work together? Is it that they don't recognize, is it they don't see the problem in the same way? Or is it that they're just tired? Right. Well, I think, you know, I think they're interesting because the pandemic and the climate change are actually interesting pieces to, 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 to look at as in conceptual because, you know, you couldn't, well, you could try, but you couldn't just see the pandemic as a regional philanthropic response. It was a global piece that right. eventually, the globally, we had to come to a place in terms of intervention. Um, and that's, you know, the world did respond and governments did respond and we did get the story and philanthropy paid a huge turbocharge in the immediate response to save lives. So the point was we, we, we realized how interconnected the world is. And that's not the last pandemic, you know, over a hundred, whatever years ago, you know, that spread right. the world as well. You know, this is not a new concept, but how we respond to that philanthropically and how the wealthier uh, nations can intervene and help and support an ecosystem to support the more vulnerable, I think is an important lesson that we that we came out of that. And I think the same is true with the environmental crisis that we're in. You know, you cannot just look at the environmental crisis in your own backyard. You have to have a coordinated approach. And, you know, again, with some of the interviews we've done recently, what we're seeing is the emergence. And it is the emergence, because the other thing that the Talking Philanthropy looked at was why it is so little, which it is, given to environmental causes. Now that's moving, it's changing, but it's a very small percentage globally. So why is that? How do we change that? And one of the things that came out of talking philanthropy was the comment from a very high net worth individual is about, well, is it, does it affect me? How do I, how do I intervene in a way that is going to help this problem? It's so overwhelming. How do I do okay. something that connects the dots? Whereas in education and in, even in the pandemic, there was a direct, you know, you sent in PPE or you sent in vaccines, you could okay. see the influence. But there's the, the challenge around climate change is that we, we find it very hard. So you have to do that on a global basis unless we work together. So I think it's a big challenge for philanthropy, but I am convinced that we're seeing signs now that people are driving philanthropy. I did an interview with, as part of Global 20 with Planet Tracker, really good example, Client Earth, another really good example. There's some really good examples of philanthropically funded initiatives that are really driving a lot of the change around this space. You've mentioned the environment several times. It's mm -hmm. not just because it's so obvious to us. I mean, we're, the world is burning, mm -hmm. um, but it also seems to be one of the things that you focus on as a, as a company. So yep. Global Philanthropic, you could just do big campaigns for places like Oxford. And we love Oxford. That's, that's <laughs> not my point. But, it, but, uh, but you're choosing to go in different directions. I mean, you're choosing to do yeah. additional things. Sure. To and, and our client problems. base is that. I mean, we diversified many years ago, sort of half through our life into advising philanthropists. Right. We've just launched corporate philanthropy, which is our third offer. Mm -hmm. You know, so we see our we see it as a moving uh, a moving space. The way we look at it is it's all about philanthropic capital flows. How do we how do we encourage that? So it's either mm -hmm. advising people to give more or give better, or advising people to raise more and raise better, or corporates beginning to think about, because governments are really in trouble, you know, we know that, there's a lot of debt, they're, they're kind of, they're constrained with what, the, with what they can do now in many economies because of the impact of, of that process. And so now we're thinking, you know, how can philanthropy uh, in the corporate world, corporates can't exist without people, without economies, without places to without work right customers without Free customers so they suddenly <laughs> in the same way environment they're going the lights going on if we don't do this we're going to be out of business the right. same is true now we believe with the social part of esg and the corporate philanthropy we believe is going to be a big thing that's going to emerge next where governments are actually sorry companies are actually working with government and philanthropists to intervene to actually have a social purpose as well as an environmental which has moved enormously recent years i, I have to ask you something i just saw um, snippets of a debate that was held in the United States. Mm -hmm. And uh, ESG was referenced. Mm -hmm. And I find that when you when we talk with people about it, they may not know what it means. Yeah. Um, even some people in our field. 
yeah. and they have difficulty defining it. Or if they can define, if they can say what the words are, it's sort of like um, with uh, DEI, which now keeps transmogrifying, it's right. changing to yeah. ensure that it's more inclusive. But as a result, sometimes we seem to be in this world of Babel where right. we're trying to discuss the same things, but maybe maybe we don't. And then what ends up also happening is that some people who may not always be in agreement that these things are important, they use that right. as a cudgel against us. Yeah. Yeah. Um, when it comes to something like ESG, uh, well, first of all, I should ask you uh, to talk about what what if you would find that from the perspective here in the UK or, you know, yeah. uh, you remit. Uh, but then more more broadly, are those the kinds of things that you can imagine the philanthropic world will keep focusing on or do they have a temporality to them? Do, you know, because. It, it, as political yeah, pressures right. come in well, and say, well, I don't know if we want to deal with that right yeah, now. Yeah, Is that going to yeah. be an influence? Yeah, I, I think it's, fast? Uh, you know, it's, a, it's an interesting area, but, you know, the environmental, main, mainly because of share, shareholder activism, mainly because of the way people demand now, customers demand environmental compliance, the, 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 you know, corporates have moved enormously very fast in the environmental space. And of course, there's a huge, there's a huge, <laughs> there's a lot more to be done. But the point is that it has really has moved. And I, I think corporates that aren't acknowledging or, or operating are at real risk in, the, in terms of their future. So I think that's fairly well documented. Okay. I think the, you know, the S bit of ESG, which is a social bit, it's very hard for companies to get their arms around that. You know, how do we, I can look at supply chains, I can look at the environmental compliance, I can get out of certain things that are fossil fuels or et cetera. How do I do the social bit? So that's around the human resource. It's about how they interact with communities. It's about, how they actually can have that partnership approach. The reality is that the, the, the needs have gone through the roof, right? right. You know, we've got now, uh, and I'm rather simplistic, but you know, one of the stats that I think is really good to mine, and this, this isn't, uh, you know, this isn't trying to make a political statement, it's just a reality of where we are in terms of inequality, you know, is this, and it's, a, you know, to round it up, it's essentially 1%, you know, of right. the world owns 50% of the wealth. Right. And, you know, the bottom, you know, the, the bottom, uh, 50% of the world owns 1% of right. the world, or under 1%. So the 150, very in, you know, you could you can analyze it more, but that's a kind of conceptual way. This is how this is, and at the same time, although it's peaked out a bit in terms of billionaires, and this isn't a negative story around, you know, bash the rich stuff. This isn't, right. that's not what this is about. But the point is the wealthy have never been as wealthy compared to the to, to, to the inequalities in the world. So this is this is something that philanthropy can address. So with capital flows with the wealth transfer that we're seeing, um, certainly amongst private individuals, there if we just divert 10, 15 percent, maybe 20 percent, my goodness, of that wealth transfer, which is what five trillion or whatever in the next 30 years. I mean, you you know, different numbers. Right. You just have to divert a bit of that flow, and it won't even hurt the next generation to the charitable causes and you can completely transform philanthropy. So, it, but is that happening here? Because in the United States, the debate, part of the, that debate has to do with, for example, donor advised funds. Yeah. And what some people would argue is actually a really good channel, not only for putting money into philanthropy at some point in time, but also National Philanthropic Trust says, no, 20% is being paid out versus foundations at 5%. Right. But then other people say, no, it's warehousing money. Yeah. You have people like Chan Zuckerberg and others who are using right. either their own foundations or people using donor advised funds to just put money away and actually not do anything with it. So right. are, are people, that transfer that you're talking about, which is so real, are, are, are we seeing that people are really manifesting that, that they're putting it to the good use or are they kind of putting it in places where they think, well, maybe I'll just hold on for a while and determine right. what I think is the best use. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I think, you know, that I, that I have a, view on donor advised funds in that that actually is around the complexity now of giving big gifts and being acknowledged for that so a lot of it's around having you know the, the idea of, of, of a collective and the idea of coming together with other philanthropists and driving gifts into organizations is a new is i think a part reaction from the scrutiny and the, the pressure that a lot of high net worth individuals are under in the old days they would just made the gift be very on the front foot and you know now they're looking for different and i you know i think that you know, that presents an opportunity, but it also, you know, it would be nice to get back to the days where we could actually be proud of what we do. Right. And we actually put our names and, you know, we, and we get acknowledgement for doing that. We don't have to give the money away. Right. So, um, you know, the Sainsbury family, for example, in, in the UK, are probably one of the most philanthropic 
you know, what they've done and their legacy and they've given way over a billion, maybe many, many billions, I'm not sure the exact number, you know, that that family is a phenomenal family. And why, you know, you want to, you want to be associated with that kind of philanthropy and those kind of beacons of families. And there's many others as well. You know, they are people that we should, I believe we should applaud and encourage others to do the same. That's the only way you're going to get the capital flows with the donor advised funds. I feel you know, it's all kind of hide, hidden behind different mechanisms. So, you know, I think that's more of a response rather than worrying about where the money is tied up. I mean, if the money is actually put to good use for environmental work as investments, then maybe it's not such a bad thing. You know, the point is they don't own the money anymore. They've given it. So the point is in the foundation, it's charitably there. You know, that's another point. You know, when you give money away, you give it, you know, so sure. <laughs> it's it's no that's longer true. yours to that's spend. True. Right. You that's, know, so right. it's going to end in it's that part of that. At some point, it's gonna, yes, it's going to. Uh, and also, I think you know the the you know the the context needs to be work global. You know, so the US is is the most philanthropic market in the world. We know that has been. It's incredible, you know. But the emerging markets now, philanthropy is totally. You know, Asia is phenomenal and it's emerging very rapidly. Africa, the global South is emerging and will be. A, you know, the global South story around philanthropy is going to be the big story for the next decades. You know, so this is not, you know, I think, you you, you know, the, the US is in, in a bit of a way of a canary of what might happen hmm. in terms of new things and how giving may, because it's so much more advanced. But, you know, we have the rest of the world to mobilize around philanthropy. We've got a lot of work to be done. You just mentioned these other major markets. I mean, I'd like to remind people in the United States that we're only 25 percent of of the, uh, the wealth, mm -hmm. um, and even though there's a lot of it in our country. And. Um, and there's a lot of philanthropy going on, but we also have a lot, a lot of organizations raising a lot of money. So there are a lot right. of people asking, yep. and that also results in some giving. But as you said, if we're kind of a canary in the coal mine for philanthropy globally, one of the things that we've seen there, and I think you're seeing here, is this kind of falling back of the percentage of people who are engaged in traditional giving. Right. Um, so a, a couple of things. I'd love to hear about your thoughts on whether or not that's that's uh, that's true here or not, mm -hmm. whether that's an accurate reflection of what's happening here, but also uh, what it's like in these other major markets yeah. where there's been so much phenomenal growth in wealth and philanthropy, yeah. um, especially in Asia, but, yeah. but also in Africa, which is a market that we generally ignore in the United States, but it's mm -hmm. so important. I mean, I, uh, you know, in answer to that, I think, you know, the, 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 there's, there's different stories in different markets and, um, you know, overall, and I think we talked about this, um, you know, overall, we we should, given the amount of inequalities, given the amount of problems the world has, frankly, we should be a lot more advanced than where we are now. You know, I, I think as a professional, I sometimes think I've spent 20 years, 30 years of my life on this. Surely we would have got more giving going by now. So my, you know, my note to self is not to be delusionally about how we've got, how far we've got, you know, one or two percent of GDP isn't really good enough, you know, 2% is pretty amazing in terms of US, but, you know, three or 4% of GDP, then you're talking. And so we've got a long way to go, given the amount of challenges that we've got. So having said that, in terms of market, so Europe is an interesting market. I mean, I think it's been difficult uh, because of, of that role of government and mm -hmm. uh, uh, NGO and UK has kind of been an interesting, you know, a lot of amazing work has happened in the UK. But it's still a lot more needs to happen, you know, and I think I was looking at some of the stats. I think you're, you, the US has suddenly got five or six times the population, but 40 times the amount of giving. You know, we've got a long way to go to catch up. Uh, but the, but the, good, the good news is we're getting there. We are, you know, this is slow, but we're getting there. But the really exciting markets are Asia because, the, it, the, the, and it's a long DNA, the, the giving has been in that, in the Asian communities a long, long time way before for, for a lot of these other communities that right, we're talking about exactly. right yes and it's been because of those because of essentially the 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 change economically of a lot of countries to a different model which isn't uh, so much command and control it's enabled philanthropy to to come out and it's created a lot of billionaires you know and there's mm -hmm. thousands of them um, across asia so the wealth creation there has has presented a huge issue around how does the next generation deal with that and how does that transfer happen and it's a very live debate and um you know you'll see this in terms of the debate has been so sophisticated in terms of the leaders in singapore and in hong kong in, increasingly about bringing that to the fore and having a discussion about the role of 
uh, that capital flow and flowing some of that into supporting and helping the communities that are there and, and addressing some of those inequalities. So that debate is very live. And I'm convinced, actually, that that's going to really explode in the next decade. I mean, you haven't seen anything yet. If Asia really continues on this trajectory, it is going to be huge. And Asia, we mean, you know, I'm, I'm talking Southeast Asia is a huge market within itself. China, you know, has has gone through a journey. It's it's it's, you know, that journey is not complete and needs to be encouraged. You know, Hong Kong has been an incredibly philanthropic place, um, and then Singapore has led the way in terms of Southeast Asia. So, and India as well has has done an enormous amount of work. So, this is all developing, and it's all it's a story yet to be had. Um, and that's what really excites me about philanthropy because I think the needs are there, the wealth is there, and it's connecting that through. Uh, philanthropy. And you mentioned the Global South before, mm -hmm. which uh, the tendency in the press or even in much of our thinking tends to be, well, that's a place where people have needs, not where there's production, mm -hmm. uh, a place where people would benefit from our help, not a place that's actually going to be a driver of philanthropy. But, you know, you work everywhere. So well, it's, talk about you know, that. it's, um, <laughs> you know, the Global South is, again, is the most, you know, Africa, uh, the Global South is one of the most exciting developments in the world and of course it's born out of the global south so it's wealth that's great out of the global south that's been circulated within the global south so this mm -hmm. kind of you know and there's you know there's big issues around historical relationships across the world we don't need to right. go there for this conversation um but the point is you know the reality is that the the, the growth potential in in that in in terms of that i in terms of that part of the world and the importance in terms of redistribution and the importance of philanthropy is absolutely massive and um you know and you see it now you know i'm having discussions with foundations in africa about multi millions they're giving hundreds of millions of dollars away these are not discussions that we would have had necessarily 10 15 years ago and so, is that because the money wasn't there or because they hadn't found their voice in philanthropy as we lots of different about reasons it? lots of different reasons but it can only be encouraged because um and and respected and i think that's the point is we didn't we're not a we can't, you know, import colonial philanthropy, right? Right. We start, you know, we've had enough of that in the past. What we and the principles of global philanthropics since day one has always been respecting each country and each region's right to philanthropy and not trying to dominate a particular view about how they should do it, how it should be done, how it should be uh, how, how there's some kind of gold standard in the world that you need to impose because right. every country is different, right? Right. And every culture is different. So we have been very mindful about how we work and support the development of philanthropy with a real, with really trying to listen and hear and understand and learn and, and, and develop best practice for each region and being culturally sensitive to that. And, and in China, that's huge, you know, in, in, in the whole Southeast Asia, that's huge. There's a huge richness that you need to respect and understand that actually we can learn from. That's even more incredible is that we, of course we can learn from and we should learn from. So we should be learning from these experiences rather than trying to impose a particular view about how it should be done. Or trying to extract things from All places that. <laughs> that where we see money. Because that's the those are the phone calls I've always received, you know, over, right. over my lifetime in this work is somebody calling from somewhere saying they have an interest in raising money in some other country where they perceive there's money to be had. Whether right. it's whether it's uh, you know, somebody in Kenya about the United States or someone in the US about somebody in Japan, it almost doesn't matter. There's always this kind of, well, we want to go and get that money and bring it back to our project. It sounds like you're, the, the approach you're taking is, is much more informed by um, the, 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 not only the local environment for philanthropy, but the individuals who are behind it and what their needs and interests are. It, sure, when, when sure. You, and it's very complicated. I mean, right. you look at education, for example, that's an ex extremely complicated you know, a lot of money has gone into education around the world. Mm. And, um, you know, the US has, you know, has the best universities, obviously, some of the best. <laughs> of course, you would say that. I, I, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, pretty, I'm in more London. <laughs> UK does pretty well. But actually, yes. there's some incredible universities. There always has been in Asia and China. It's some of the best oh, in yes. the world. So, you know, but the idea, and, and, and Ronnie Chan spoke about this, and again, that's on our Talking Philanthropy. Mm -hmm. He did a brilliant uh, talk about why the, the you know the gift the 300 million gift um and and i do encourage you that's on the talking philanthropy work the site is that was a year before the pandemic and we, we also talked about the probability of a pandemic happening then as well 
which is remarkable a year before it happened. So that's a that's a, a, a video that I often go back to look at because Ronnie is just a remarkable leader in philanthropy in Asia. And for anyone that wants to learn about tra wealth transition in that family context, you should have a look at that. Uh, before we even go any further, I want to make sure we direct people to that content, make reference to it here, even for those who are uh, viewing this after the fact. So to view those videos. Yeah, so um, Talking Philanthropy was born out of uh, Global Philanthropic. We wanted to convene and help orchestrate change in the world. So we developed a, a forum, which is a, a, a forum to bring everyone together, which is called Talking Philanthropy. So globalphilanthropic.com is us and Talking Philanthropy is our our forum for that. So on there, you've got all on YouTube, you can see all the videos. And going back to this, so we've done four of them now. Um, and the last one was funded by Gates and it was in partnership with the UN. Uh, Banking Moon opened it and talked about the, the challenges of, of the pandemic and how we needed to work to the SDGs and develop philanthropy again, another incredible speech. Um, and we worked with Cambridge University's Judge Business School and, uh, and it was hosted by uh, Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy at NUS. Um, and we had a lot of other partners. There's six hours of content just for that one. Right. But it started, as I say, with 50 people in my lounge. <laughs> and it ended up as the biggest, I think, um, well, online. Well, you had, what, 5,000? We had 5,052 like countries, six hours of content. But, I mean, it was at a time when everyone was stuck at home, right? Sure. So, sure. you know, it, we, had the, we had the audience. True. But just because people were at home didn't mean they needed to tune in and, and talk about Maybe. <laughs> how to help other people. <laughs> Um, people were often thinking about themselves. So it says yeah. a great deal. Plus, it was global in nature. They weren't yeah. just showing up because for a global thing because it's global philanthropic. They were interested in working with people in other countries. Yeah. That in itself is pretty remarkable. Did the pandemic really open that door for you and for them? I, I think it did. And, uh, you know, it's very strange because we've always been a virtual company. I mean, it's a bit weird. We've never been in a, one country. We've always been spread over the world. So we've already worked virtually. And um, when the pandemic hit, we decided as a business what we would do, and we decided that we would try and um, help people respond to the pandemic. So I, I actually, because I was restricted to my house, I got my 11-year-old to hold the camera up and I sat under a tree and I did, um, I think, 11 uh, sessions of 10 minutes, which was still on YouTube. They're not the best produced thing, I'm afraid. <laughs> You'd probably tear your hair out, right? <laughs> but um, anyway, we got it under a tree. Yeah, there it goes. Um, <laughs> Anyway, um, and we did these and we put them out and um, we put them out. I try to do one every week just to try and sure. help people respond. And, you know, suddenly everyone's thousands of people are watching this thing. And it's, you know, isn't the best produced thing because it's under a tree. But, you know, and it's in my garden. So but that was that was what it was. And, and that sort of led us then to think, you know, how do we produce content to to support it? Now, obviously, the videos that we took of uh, the London events mm -hmm. uh, and it grew and it grew and several hundred people came and. We had amazing speakers and we had themes around women in philanthropy and, um, and you know, incredible about mission. And we've, and we've done a number of these. And then the final one, it should have been in person. The concept was actually to have people at Cambridge University students and also at NUS. And they would have a, 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 yeah, a conversation sure. at the end of the event, which is why we timed it in the way that we did. Because no, no students weren't allowed in the building. So we had to kind of innovate there as well and, and do it all virtually with case studies. So. But, you know, so the journey we've been on, and you were ahead of it because you've been doing this for a long time, <laughs> has been from kind of under a tree to one of the biggest forums in the world, I think it is now. And, wow. and by the way, we're just about to announce our next one. OK, well, I was going to ask you that, <laughs> but I wasn't sure if you'd answer. Is it sort of like asking someone if they were going to run for president or not? Uh, so, um, but you, if people want to learn about the next one, there will be a next one. We're going to announce it soon, yeah. And okay. it's I, what I will tell you about, it's going to be around this issue of wealth transfer. All right. And it's going to be very Asia focused. And it sounds like it won't be entirely academic because oh, no. that's it's, it's a lot of wealth transfer conversations yeah. have been is it 114 trillion, is yeah. it five trillion? And when yeah. does it transfer? This is this is much more about yeah what it means. Right. I mean, okay. And and I think the amazing thing about this sort of conversation we're having now is that you know you can really help um, you know, help encourage people to look at resources and find out more, whether it's through interviewing of high net worth talking about their journey there's a brilliant one of the global 20s so to celebrate our 20th anniversary we did a 20 interview so we're up to number 16 i think they're all on our website but if you look at steve shirley and lady edwina grosvenor who are two amazing philanthropists and there's two um two videos of them have a look at that but steve shirley in particular talks about her journey and you know you start getting insights that are just impossible to have without actually sitting with those individuals so 
we now like this kind of conversation we can learn an awful lot and it's accessible to everyone in the world so this is a remarkable asset that we need to propagate to help capital flows it it, it does sound like there was an appetite for this and people and you're producing important content mm -hmm. and uh and that's why people are driven to it but are you finding there's more of an appetite for it in some places than others i mean are you finding much of an american audience yet yeah i mean i think around the world it's the, the world's completely changed hasn't it i mean it and 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 what philanthropy needs to do is to uh is to re respond to that inflection point and to get ahead of it right so as a company we're completely committed to digital we're completely committed to open source and providing as much information oh, as we can sure. so that we're actually encouraging best practice around the world and now we're using that in our advisory so i would be advising a client and they might say oh uh, and I'll say, oh, well, you should watch this video because that's the, right. that's what you need to look at, right? <laughs> sure. And then even now, which is really more exciting is because we have now, frankly, have a massive uh, social media network that we as a business have got, particularly in Asia and across the world. People are very interested in presenting their philanthropic opportunities within that context. So we now can have discussions with clients that mean that we bring that to the table, which is kind of powerful. Can you can you draw that out a little bit? Because one of the things that we always try to do in this series is make sure that people have practical takeaways, which is hard when you're trying to also discuss things yeah. in a big in a big way. And these are big issues you're you're discussing with us. Um, and that is okay, there are all these people out there and they want to do good in the world. That's yeah. clear. But for the most part, we don't have a lot of information on them. Right. There, there are companies like Donor Search that are gathering that on an yeah. individual country basis, yeah. sometimes a regional basis, yeah. but it's largely about maybe um, the resources they have, the companies yeah. they've built, a little bit yeah. of biography. It's not that they're sitting around thinking about ESG or they're wondering how they can honor their son. Yeah. It sounds like by bringing some of these people and forces together, by having these conversations, whether they're on video in these big forums, that you actually make it possible for people to get to know each other. Possibly, yeah. Why not? You know, I mean, it's very interesting. Some of the big universities, when they responded to uh, to the pandemic, some of the big research universities would have advisory committees, and I, I won't mention who they are, but before the advisory committee, there'd be all these great names and no one would turn up. And they, during the pandemic, everyone was online. All 20, you know, one very un famous university had all 24 advisors, and they were all billionaires, high net worth because they needed that information. They needed to interact with that information. Mm -hmm. So, and, you know, high net worths do not really want to be visible, <laughs> most of them. And, and, right? but, but tell us why. <laughs> I mean, I, I know it sounds obvious, but why is that? Because it's difficult. You know, it's difficult. It's a weird world that you live in. They're besieged. You know? Well, you know, it's it's tricky. You have, um, you have relationships that perhaps you're not sure are real. You, you know, so trust uh, becomes important. You have a lot of people defending their interests. Um, so, you know, us fundraisers get pretty close to them, right. you know, and we should do because it's a part of that journey. Right. But, you know, increasingly it's very difficult and technology, you know, whether it's being filmed, whether it's being, you know, you're under constant monitor, really. So, you know, the, the world has moved on. So in a way, the great news is that we now can we, we can actually disseminate best practice around the world at very low cost. We can operate in forums and bring people together. That's the great news. The bad news is I think people are going back to the donor advice funds. People are more cautious about their brand. They're more cautious about how they interact with philanthropy. They're perhaps more cautious about making those emotional connections and bold statements. They need to think very carefully about it. And that's not helping us in terms of driving those capital flows. There have been a lot of, um, in the last few years, debates about, uh, obviously about inequality yeah. for all the right reasons. And uh, but I suppose that means sometimes that there is a there is like we, what you described earlier is kind of the bashing of the of the wealthy. Yeah. Um, it, is that one of the reasons why people are more circumspect? Um, is it reputation? I, I, I think the world has just changed for high net worth enormously. I really do. And I think um, and, I, and I and I know it sounds like you know you say well that's a good problem to have, isn't it? But you know I I think it's tricky. And I think you know we need to understand that their worlds have changed and that, that they're more. They're more worried about lots. Of, I mean, the world's changed. The world has become a lot more risky place to be in. Okay. Period. Yeah. Right. Whether that's traveling across borders, whether that's you know a whole issue that you know this is you know this is in a different mode we're in, and now we have technology operating in a way that you know some of us we don't even understand half of this stuff is happening, and then we have got AI coming down the chute. So there's lots of not coming down the chute. It's come down the chute, right? It's <laughs> arrived. It's here. <laughs> it's yeah. arrived. So, you know, there's complex things. So 
you know, going back to the good old relationship, you know, relationships are important and face-to-face -face is critical. But if we are trying to power uh, philanthropic uh, flows around the world to meet these massive inequality problems, to meet these huge environmental problems, and we're really serious about it, then we have to use all the tools in our toolbox. And I think technology and digitalization is a critical one. Well, you were talking earlier about this and, and both uh, during this conversation, but also prior to it, about um, the feelings you've had. Uh, you, you've invested a lot of your life and energy in this. Yeah. Um, and I know you've seen a lot of successful campaigns along the way. Um, but how much it's moved the needle is always yeah. the question. So what is it that's ultimately, you think, going to move the needle? What is it that the rest of us need to do, not right. just... Uh, you know, to raise it from 2% of GDP to 3%, which seems very abstract, but to to really address the problems that plague all of us. Yeah, yeah, well, it's a great question. And I think it's multi-leveled. I mean, I think, so, so there's a number of different angles. So if you take the corporate philanthropy story, the boardroom needs to start talking about what they're doing, right? They're not at the moment. We talk to a lot of corporates. The CEOs tell us that they've got a minute in, a, in an agenda, and it's lucky if it's that environmental is taking a huge part of the agenda up we need to move that now to think about really big corporate engagement through philanthropy so that's and that's not csr this is a whole different ball game of okay. getting serious about protecting and working and helping their communities that they're in so that's that's the corporate i think behind that worse you know we can't i don't believe you get there by you know blaming and shaming you get there by convincing and engaging right um, and the reality is we all know that, you know, giving is the best thing that high net worth can do and they get the, the most pleasure out of it. And that's not just us being good old, you know, from our good old, uh, you know, starry eyed selves. And right. is, you know, it really is. It's the, it's the ultimate purchase of nothing, right, other than an emotional connection. So we need to really keep going. And then I think for the sector, we need to be thinking bigger and bolder. We need to be, be developing a lot of creativity in what we do. We are not a widget machine. You know, you should never be. The, the big gifts come out of bold ideas. You know, we need to keep driving those big gifts. We need to be driving those big ideas and engaging people that can really make a difference and show them how they can make a difference. So, you know, it's and then we've got all the ethics and the standards, which we've, we've gone a long way, which we had to, you know, we've got we've improved globally now in terms of processes and systems. We're a lot smarter and wiser than we were. We've moved on. And we're now kind of more fit for purpose now. We know what good looks like in terms of those. We didn't particularly before. I think we kind of just, it was all instinctual back in the day, right? right? So we've got that now. We've got that framework. But now we need to drive this and we need to, and the money is there. The transfer is there and the needs are there. So the chemistry is there. Going back to your point, yeah, I'm frustrated. I mean, I think I spent all my life devoted to philanthropy. I, I'd much prefer that we were much further on and then we were having a conversation about the five families that gave 100 million in the last week, right? I'm, I'm not sure I can name those the five families at the moment. And it should be happening in environment. It should be happening in addressing inequality, in education. And it should be opening up all these issues and people will get real joy out of it. There's a lot to unpack in all this. Um, for, the, for people who are interested in getting the kind of advice that you're providing, um, I know you can direct them to a website. Yeah, but more specifically, what what kind of organization is going to benefit from having a chance to either attend talking philanthropy or right. participate in something that you well, do? Well, talking philanthropy is it's open, so it's open for everyone. Okay. And it's there's no fee. It's not a conference. It's it's really a gift. It's our company's gift of, of right. content to philanthropy to help support it. We decided that we would we would convene and we would orchestrate change and and the sub. Uh, the theme of the last Talking Philanthropy was trying to look at the philanthropic ecosystem of Asia and the role of government. So we really, into, that's why we did it with Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy, um, Professor Danny Kua, who's the lead there, because we wanted that School of Public Policy to lead the debate about what is the role of government. And Singapore's a great example where this is, where government has done the right thing in terms of encouraging philanthropy. Now, if you magnify that across Asia, then it really, really takes off. So go government was recognized as a as a blocker um or a, as an enabler putting it the other way around okay so how do we get governments to acknowledge it so you know that's the theme so we so we as a firm we want to uh, convene and we want to orchestrate change um but you know so we've got we've got an enormous amount of work to do 
in that space. But um, so that's open for everyone. But in terms of, you know, I, I'm a, I, a lot of the early work that I did was around the art and science of, of, of philanthropy. And that's because I'm a crazy artist. I did fine art was my sociology and fine art. I'm totally unemployable, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> there we are. Sociology and fine art. How did that work? There we go. But the reality is, you know, um, and trust me, artists can do all right nowadays. But um, but the point is that, that the, you know, the, the, the idea of bringing creativity into philanthropy is what's driven all the big gifts that we've worked on. That's 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 where it started. It's about really being creative about what could happen. So people that come to us are, are, are you know, uh, you know, they want to achieve great things. They are ambitious. You know, we, we are not a good option for people that aren't willing to be creative, aren't willing to take a risk, aren't willing to be bold and ambitious and kind of think, you know, differently about the scenario. But for those that are, bring it on, you know, because that's how you really accelerate big change. And that's across the organization. The Absolutely. fundraisers, the executive Everything. directors. We, when we're talking, we're talking with high net worth, we move the goalposts. We tell them to give a lot more money away. Right. We talk them, we think about And that's based a lot of, we do benchmarking. We do all the stuff that consultancy does. Don't, it's not that kind of airy fairy that I just do a picture. <laughs> oh, there's a painting. Go away and try and do that. You know, how about this? You know, it's not that bad. But, you know, there's a lot of rigor behind what we do as well. But right. fundamentally, the creativity in our business is what's going to make the difference in terms of the big gifts. Yeah. Okay. So more Banksy, I guess, in the middle. Yeah. Of the well, his room. exhibition's amazing. My daughter actually <laughs> managed to go and see it in 2016 on her own in really? Glasgow. Yeah. Last week. She got a ticket. It's amazing. We we missed it. We missed it. Okay. <laughs> so that, that's what happens when you're hanging out here enough. Obviously, you miss you miss the big stuff, but at least we didn't miss it now. You, you are more than the bank seat of okay. philanthropy. I don't know about that. Uh, <laughs> and, <wish>. uh, <laughs> but thank you so much for this. Man. Not at really, all. Really appreciate Real it. Pleasure. Um, and uh, obviously, once again, if you want to learn more about uh, Global Philanthropic as a whole, and the work they do. And if you are planning on doing something big, hopefully something impactful and big, then I hope you'll talk with them, look for their website. And once again, for the URL, you'll- It's just globalphilanthropy.com and talkingphilanthropy.com. Yeah, right, right, forward. those are the two. So to learn and to get the help you need. Um, and if you've been following this series, I hope you'll also share it with those who found that noon was not, not our usual time, was a difficult time for them. So do share it with a colleague. And if you are of a mind to join us next week when we're in, of all places, Indianapolis, it'll be the APRA conference where we'll be showing up and doing our red carpet event. That's on Tuesday, the 29th uh, at the APRA conference. So I hope you'll join us for that. That should be a lot of fun. But until then, um, farewell from uh, from London and from, wow. Pick Regent Street. Regent Street, Street. Street. <laughs> yes. Steps from Piccadilly. Um, good to see you all. Take care. Thank you, Ben. Thank you very much. Okay.